Hi, everyone. Hello. We're in the Pure Worship, Chapter 6. Uh, they've now gone back in time to chapters 3 and 4, so in the book and in time they've gone back. So in the last chapter they went from chapter 8 to chapter 22. Yeah, and now, now they're, they're back, back to chapters to three, and four. 3 and 4. Okay. Okay, we don't really know why they do that. But what effect uh, does it have? It well, I think it it helps you not get the flow of the story and the sequence and the ev and the people involved like what happens to them and it, it leaves a liberty with the watchdog writers to drop out complete passages complete chapters without you noticing without you noticing yeah 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 so we will read the paragraphs unless you wanted to read the feature scripture let's first. read the, the the feature scripture which is ezekiel chapter 4 1 to 3 yes and you, son of man, take a brick and lay it before you and engrave on it a city, even Jerusalem, and put siege works against it and build a siege wall against it and cast up a mound against it. Set camps also against it and plant battering rams against it all around. And you take an iron griddle and place it as an iron wall between you and the city and set your face toward it and let it be in a state of siege and press the siege against it. This is a sign for the house of Israel. Now they go further in the description, right? But these yeah. are the verses they definitely want you to read. So they've got, um, the title of this is The End is Now Upon You. And they reference Ezekiel 7.3. And they say the focus is Jehovah's prophetic judgments against Jerusalem. How fulfilled. Okay. The first paragraph is, the news about the prophet Ezekiel's strange behavior spreads rapidly among the exiled Jews living in the land of Babylon. For a week he has been sitting dazed and speechless among the exiles, but then he suddenly got up and shut himself in his house. Now, with his perplexed neighbors looking on, the prophet reappears, picks up a brick, puts it in front of him, and etches it with a drawing. Then, without uttering a word, Ezekiel begins to build a miniature wall. All this is from Ezekiel 3 and 4. The spectators, no doubt growing in number, must have wondered, what does all this mean? Only later would the Jewish exiles fully grasp the prophet Ezekiel's puzzling behavior, foretold the coming of a dreadful event that would express Jehovah God's righteous indignation. What was that event? How did, effect, how did it affect the ancient nation of Israel? What significance does it have for pure worshipers today? So although they've officially abandoned types and antitypes, as they say at the back of the book, Mm -hmm. They want it to have an application. Now let's think about what that must be. Mm -hmm. Here's the next subhead. Take a brick, take wheat, and take a sharp sword. In about 613 BCE, by the way, that's the wrong date, Jehovah instructed Ezekiel to demonstrate by signs three aspects of God's coming judgment against Jerusalem. They were the siege of the city, the suffering of its inhabitants, and the destruction of the city and its people. Let us consider these three aspects in more detail. The siege of Jerusalem first. Jehovah told Ezekiel, take a brick and put it in front of you. Lay siege to it. The brick represented the city of Jerusalem, while Ezekiel himself portrayed the Babylonian army as used by Jehovah. Ezekiel was also instructed to build a miniature wall, a siege rampart, and to make battering rams. He was then to place these around the brick. They represented the instruments of war, that Jerusalem's enemies would use when surrounding the city and attacking it. To indicate the iron-like strength of the enemy soldiers, Ezekiel was to put an iron griddle or plate between himself and the city. He then set his face against it, face against the city. These confrontational actions served as a sign to the house of Israel that the unthinkable was about to happen. Jehovah would use an enemy army to lay siege to Jerusalem, the chief city of God's people. The location of God's temple. The suffering of Jerusalem's inhabitants. 
Jehovah ordered Ezekiel, take wheat, barley, broad beans, lentils, millet, and spelt, a type of wheat, and make them into bread, and weigh out and eat twenty shekels of food per day. Jehovah then explained, I am cutting off the food supply. In this scene, Ezekiel no longer represented the Babylonian army. Rather, he took on the role of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The prophet's actions foretold that the coming siege would cause the food supplies in the city to dwindle. At that time, bread would be made from an odd mixture of ingredients, which indicated that the people would have to eat whatever they found. How severe would the starvation become? As, a, as if directly addressing the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Ezekiel said, Father among you will eat their sons, fathers among you will eat their sons, and sons will eat their fathers. In the end, many would suffer because of the deadly arrows of famine, and the people would waste away. Okay. So obviously, what what you're thinking about, if you're a Jehovah's Witness today, is the terrible ending for these people who pretended to be, claimed to be God's people. But what you're, mm. what you're of course, omitting is that the great majority of Israel, as unfaithful as they were, are already in exile at this point. Yeah. I mean, even this audience that's watching him yeah. are with him in Babylon. And they're not, therefore, suffering the worst, which is described here, the famine, the cannibalism, and the destruction of the city and the temple. They are not suffering that. They are in exile. Yes, they're, they're suffering, all right. And but it, like told, Ezekiel, yeah. they're suffering with their people. Yeah, they're being told what's going to happen to the people in Jerusalem. Yeah. So yeah. I, I like the fact that they've made what these actions, these strange actions of Ezekiel. He's representing something that we need to think about if we're witnesses or ex-witnesses. Mm -hmm. Namely that, for one, representing the Babylonian army or Nebuchadnezzar's army, you are in effect confirming what Jeremiah has already said back in Jerusalem. He's still there when Ezekiel is in Babylon. Jeremiah has said that Nebuchadnezzar is now the servant of Jehovah. Mm -hmm. Well, as a witness, you're not comfortable with anybody being called a servant of Jehovah. It was not yeah. you. Yeah. But then there's also the fact that Ezekiel now, in, in, the, in these rations that he has to live with and this terrible situation of having to cook them on dung, mm -hmm. he's now identifying with the situation of the people who are back in the city Mm -hmm. He will not have to. He yeah. will not have to die that death or live that way himself. But Jeremiah and everybody that's there will. Yeah. So I think when I was a witness, I wouldn't have. Would have been hard for me to fit, in my mind, which prophets lived at the same time. I, d I didn't have that clear in my head. So the fact that Jeremiah is in Jerusalem. And Ezekiel is in. Babylon already. I I wouldn't have really kind of pieced it all together in my mind. I and Daniel's know. there too. Yeah. At this very time. So there, yeah. there's there's people that have already been exiled. I think when we're witnesses, we focus on who's going to die. Mm -hmm. Where's the death in this? The judgment. And here it's indicating some would die, but even among them, not all of them die. No. No. Jeremiah is exiled. Again, thousands are taken in exile even after the destruction of the city and the temple. So, yeah. so what lesson you draw from this about today is really erroneous because most Jews suffered the, the exile as Leviticus and Deuteronomy had predicted. That's, that the, that's the judgment, exile, yeah. diaspora. But, so but they, don't, they don't suffer the annihilation that you need for your type that Christendom yeah. is going to be like this too. Yeah, so so you just have everyone, you just think about everybody dying and them being out of favor. That's right. But uh, Jeremiah is prophesying and Ezekiel is prophesying this is going to happen in Jerusalem. Jeremiah makes a point of telling the people to submit. That's if right. If they submit, they don't have to die. Mm-hmm. So th that part, I think if you're reading the whole text, it, it starts to come together, and you read Jeremiah as well, you start to see the whole picture, that not everybody is just executed. They use that word, execute. 
yeah. in, in, in these passages. So they're thinking in terms of the, the good guys are going to be saved and the bad guys are going to be destroyed. But that doesn't fit this picture, No, does it, it doesn't, because you've got Ezekiel. Would, would you, as a Jehovah's Witness, think he's a pure worshiper? I think you would say yes. But he's still suffering and with Jeremiah, God's people. Jeremiah, yes, he's a pure worshiper. But he's still suffering, like you said. He's yeah. still suffering with his people. Yeah. And he's still calling them his people. And Jeremiah, as we know, as if you're a witness, you believe Jeremiah wrote Lamentations. What's yeah. his attitude towards his own people, who, yeah. who, according to your logic, are suffering just judgment? What's yeah. his attitude towards he's them? He's lamenting. He's weeping, weeping for them. Weeping for them. And Daniel is praying for them. Mm -hmm. Daniel chapter 9, the only time he mentions the name Jehovah in the book of Daniel, even in the New World Translation, mm -hmm. the only time he uses the name is in in a, the context of praying for his people to be restored mm -hmm. and the temple to be rebuilt. And he suffers the same miseries that they do. So you don't get the lesson you want. So what's the way to deal with that? Well, quote the part you like. Yeah. The judgment. Emphasize the, the deaths, the, the executions, the the people who who uh, get the sword who who defy Nebuchadnezzar they yeah. deserve the fate they get well I, I don't doubt that maybe Ezekiel and Daniel and a few other Jews in exile felt the same way because they had already submitted to Babylon yeah. and ended up in Babylon yeah and yeah. and, and yeah. that works out to the betterment of these Jews because they actually thrive read Jeremiah 29 where they actually thrive in exile and they're mm -hmm. being told to to Bless that city. Bless these people yeah. that you're now among. But well, I think there's every indication that they want these people to see it. They're they're rejected a lot by a lot, and not listened to. But they want them to listen to them. Right. They but, want them to be saved. Do you want non-Jehovah's Witnesses to be saved? Do Do you feel compassion for them, or are you almost Rejoicing. Well, yeah, with they what you think is going to be their destruction. How about ex witnesses? Oh, yeah. What What is the the flavor of the way you talk about the, these people? They're not being encouraged, Jehovah's Witnesses today, to feel any empathy for people outside their own circle, and yeah. and this token obedience to go out and preach to them, not talk to them, preach to them. Judgment, yeah. really, Armageddon yeah. dead ahead. At least in our day, I can say, when we were pioneers, uh, there were some articles in the Watchtower that that spurred us to be more sympathetic to the plight of people. Yeah. But nowadays, I don't even sense that they're, they're sympathetic to the plight of their own people if you're not yeah. a core member. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the big point that they're missing is that God restored this people. All of this discipline, all of this judgment is about restoring them to a right mind, a, a, yeah. a godly mind. And you have to ask the question, why are they still here? The Jews. <laughs> yeah. Why are they still here later? if they're so bad and God is going to mm -hmm. get rid of them, dismiss them? Well, then you shouldn't even find them here. Yeah, by your own logic, they would be the first to be annihilated because they not yeah. only broke God's law, which had only been given to them, and they, and they killed God's Messiah. Yeah. Oh, they were the only people who had a Messiah. And they killed them. So why are they around at all? I, I that was one of the things that turned my mind around, because mm -hmm. the Jews are not only around like they did in Babylon mm -hmm. back then, where they thrived if they if they yeah. submitted to Babylon. They're thriving in this world today, and we all know that. And after Christ dies, it's still to the Jew first. Yeah. You hear them always presenting it to the Jew first. Yeah. What's our link? Uh, two, uh, Jeremiah forces two JWs to face the seriousness of false prophecy and new light excuses. Yes, yeah, so back to Jerusalem, Jeremiah 27, 28, mm -hmm. uh, right next to the one I just cited, 29, where they're told to, to work on behalf of this place they now live in mm -hmm. and, and pray for its, its success, its prosperity. But in 27, they're told Nebuchadnezzar is the servant of Jehovah. And if you don't believe that, you're going to end yeah. up in a very bad predicament mm -hmm. 
And then 28 is the confrontation between Jeremiah and Hanani. Yeah. And what's it about? It's about the date w yeah. when they will return. Mm -hmm. So this has direct application if you're talking to lo your loved yeah. ones among Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. Two prophets. See you soon.